Alan Genesis by Simon Herewood. Book One Progeny of Hate. Chapter Fifteen Breck Occupied. It was hardly a decision in the end. The simple truth was that there was no feasible alternative, at least for the moment. Though he did not trust and even disliked the strangely intimidating sorcerer, Rune had him to thank for his timely rescue from what would soon have become a desperate predicament. Moreover, his song was all but sung in the aisles, with the reins already slipping from the aging fingers of Rastgent and the many wolves gathering for the spoils. He was on the lookout for a different base from which to pursue his trading enterprise, and if what Karth had stated the previous night was true, and Malik Yulian's hand was ultimately bent against all Murians, Monborg would not be the ideal locale he had expected it might have been. Though technically outside the spreading realm of Terralon, this rambling jungle city was very much under the sway of the Southern Lord, and saturated with his agents and traders. He would therefore form a wary alliance with the Master of Heron Inrath, but endeavor to discover the truth for himself, since he would not be the willing thrall of any man, and refuse to become a martyr for any cause, however noble. He had tasted firsthand of betrayal and injustice, and seen the triumph of jealousy and envy. Thus, he could find nothing that was worth standing for, unless it was the enrichment and advancement of the self, through whatever means possible. That was what men called love, the most admirable of codes, but ultimately the essence of selfishness, for did it not wish benefits on its object, only to gratify the one who held it, to satisfy his own need, was that not all his consuming passion for Athera had demanded? To own her affection, her time, her adoration, and when she was beyond his reach, had it not all turned to bitter dust? No one sacrificed himself purely for the benefit of others, without the hope of sharing some bright tomorrow with them. The selfless hero existed only for children, or the simple-minded. He no longer turned his thoughts in this direction, for it led inexorably to a philosophy of doubt and a drowning sea of pleasure-seeking and self-indulgence. These eventually cast their exponents out upon a shore of meaningless opportunity, weak and unprotected by the bulwarks of honor and self-denial, patriotism and sacrifice. Yet he could no longer turn to these high ideals to keep him strong. He turned instead to his thirst for justice, for vengeance, and even the basest lust for blood and power over mortal lives. This is what sustained him, he knew, and prevented him from decaying into a mere shadow, some flotsam washed up on Myral's shores. At first, he had denied this truth, holding that he could leave the past behind and exist only in a world of shallow physical pleasure and pain. But the memories had dragged on him like a dead limb, from which he could in no way be separated. In time, he found that his hurt and disappointment congealed into a bitterness that all the wines of Pranacum, all the maidens of Estium could never sweeten. Then he had embraced it as his source of strength, his reason for being. He was already the bitter weed, forever sprouting in abundance amongst the sweet grapes of Ligerium spreading through the isles, traveling on the winds to Aaron, touching unknown islands in the endless ocean. Who could say, eventually it might find a way to penetrate the fastness of Nuria itself. And now such a promise loomed in the words of this unknown sorcerer. However little he trusted the man, his carefully hidden hopes had revived with such intensity that he had been surprised at it. Athera was dead. 
There was no way of repairing the wrong of the past, but he yearned for the chance to twist himself around the vine of its perpetrators and choke the very life out of it. Karth was in quite a different humor to the one he had been in the day before. The storm had passed, barely lasting the night for all its intensity. There were small signs of damage everywhere, branches stripped bare or torn from trees, driftwood and weed washed up far beyond the usual high water mark, puddles of rainwater reflecting the clear sky. Yet no perceivable harm had come to the structures and vessels of the islanders. The preparations of the day before had not been in vain. He wore a little smile when Arun clasped his hand in partnership, and it was not mocking or triumphant in any way, for he seemed genuinely pleased, even cheerful. They broke their fast together while he elaborated on the type of missions on which he would need the erstwhile pirate captain to embark. It was clear that there would be dangers aplenty, for when not engaged in actual combat, such as would occur during rescue attempts in the jungles of the Southland, there would be the chance of being discovered in the cities of Nuria and Ligurium from which he had been exiled. Ultimately, there would be the unknown terrors of the realm of Malik Yulian, the swamps and forests of Terralon itself. The adventure of it was at once enticing and alluring, involuntarily quickening the blood of a man of action such as Lord Rune. Karth knew this only too well, and played his hand masterfully. If he exaggerated here and there, he believed, climactic times called for extreme measures. Here long, though, he realized that he was pouring oil on an already hot fire. He could well recognize the eagerness in the eyes of this adventurer, such as might be perceived in those of a merchant at the sight of a shipload of rare silks from distant lands. But there was something too intense about this enthusiasm, something almost perverse in the way this fish swallowed the baited hook. It was disconcerting for the old man, who caught himself for a fleeting moment doubting the other's soundness of mind. There followed several days of mutual discovery for Rune and the handful of other Viron fighting men in Karth's service. The prince observed, to his amazement, that the islanders did not train with Viron blades at all. Ordinary steel, though well crafted, made up their armaments. Hanik explained that the covert nature of their enterprises precluded the use of such easily identifiable weapons as blades. Under no circumstances were the Nurians to know that a few of their own formed part of another realm. You were quite a find, Prince Rune. There are but nineteen Viron on Heron Inrath, two of which are women and not given to fighting. Both of them have borne children to husbands in Nuria, and may therefore, according to Imran's blessing, not bear children for another Viron husband. We may at present increase our numbers only as we are able to find exiled or dissident Viron. Such is our predicament. You sound, Hanik, as if you would have preferred picking a lovely virgin out of the cauldron and not a bearded pirate. There was a flash of very white teeth and a loud burst of laughter. That may well be so, Prince. That may well be. During the sparring and training it was the islanders' turn to be amazed. The pirate showed such extraordinary skill, even with the heavier steel sword, that soon only the local champion, Jumil, dared cross blades with him. The other fencing activity presently ceased, the men lining up along the walls of the courtyard to watch. Back and forth the weapons flashed in the morning sun, almost too quick for the eye to follow, the wielders themselves advancing or retreating with rapid paces as the particular maneuver demanded. Jumil was a master, and confident in his skill. He had the advantage initially, as his opponent had had barely an hour of practice with the unfamiliar weapon. Rune still tended to overbalance, or put too much power behind his thrusts and parries, so that his blade was fractionally slower than the others. Consequently, he was forced onto the defensive most of the time, making up in sheer speed of hand and body for what he still lacked in finesse. 
Jumil would exploit an overly energetic thrust to launch a lightning attack. Then would follow a furious flashing of blades and swift movement as his opponent gradually recovered, and he would have to wait for the next opportunity. Yet as time wore on, these became more and more rare. The courtyard was packed by now with men of all races who had rushed in from adjoining courtyards, storerooms, or kitchens in response to a quick urging from a friend or after sensing some of the excitement in the air itself. Here they stood, darker skins from the Southlands, fairer men from Aran, long-haired giants from the West March, Ligerians, Track Islanders, wild men from the Fever Coast, silent and intent on the spectacle before them. Rune's metal wand had at last conjured an impenetrable shield in front of him. His face broke into a slight grin as he felt the blade become an extension of his arm, moving where his thought directed it without hesitation or the slightest delay. Now his mind groped for a quick maneuver, a trick to catch his opponent off guard and end the bout in his favor. Yet he respected the skill of the Viron too greatly to subject him to the tactics of the arena. He would best him in a way that would not make him look foolish. Jumil realized the truth soon enough. His probing attacks no longer made any impression. His feints and maneuvers were countered before fully executed. He was perspiring heavily, forcing himself to keep a steady mind and allow no hint of despondency to breach his concentration. At the same time, his amazement grew at the utter talent of the stranger. He was suddenly on the defensive, unable to pinpoint just where the tide had turned, and hard-pressed to hold his own. What was it the old men tauntingly threw at the impudence of youth? Something about the bridling of a lion with straw? He could not chase the fearful image out of his mind. He no longer saw the men crowding the courtyard, nor did he hear their excited voices raised in admiration or encouragement, though part of him disliked their witnessing of what was his now inevitable dethronement. He kept his eyes locked on those of his opponent. He was quite certain that the other enjoyed the bout immensely. There was the trace of a smile on his face, but his eyes were fixed and unreadable, giving away nothing about the next move of his sword. The gaze inspired fear, for it was undoubtedly that of a master predator. He struggled to keep the fear out of his own eyes as attack followed lightning attack. Then it was over, almost to his relief, with the other's blade touching the scarlet leather padding of his left shoulder. The roars of approval abruptly washed around them, and he realized at once that the acclaim was not reserved for the newcomer only. This was perhaps the best performance his own comrades had seen him give. Rune's broad smile displayed his excellent humor in a flash of white. He gripped his opponent's hand warmly. You should travel to the Isles for a tour of the arenas. There is hardly a man among the Easterners to offer you competition. Jumil returned the smile despite himself. You must have had an easy time of it then. I have heard of your skill in the arena, and now I have experienced it. I no longer marvel at what was said. And I use the proper blade and not this heavy plowshare. They both burst out laughing. Then Hanik was at his elbow. Enjoying yourself? Immensely. My apologies for interrupting then, but we have only an hour before departure. Departure? Hanik's voice was matter of fact. We're going south. The first volley of arrows halted the triumphantly pursuing savages in confusion and bewilderment. They had not expected anything resembling resistance from the fleeing villagers after the local warriors' ranks had been so easily smashed in the initial assault. The village was already burning, and the slaughter of the old and feeble well underway. All that remained was the rounding up of women and children hiding in the jungle and the dispatching of the odd defenders to offering opposition. Now they stood staring at the tree line 
from which the unexpected flight of arrows had come, felling nearly a dozen of their companions. Sweat glistened on their half-naked bodies, running over straining muscles and heaving chests, smoothing the edges of grotesque designs in white and red paint, which had transformed them into these merciless masked demons. The elation of battle and killing still strained their eyes, the shrieks and cries of slaughter had but recently vanished from their throats. As yet, their foe was invisible, hidden among the jungle thickets, and silent. They hesitated, searching for some clue to direct their charge, still brandishing spiked gloves and war spears fearlessly. They had come from Gor Amul itself, agents of the Irresistible One. No one challenged them for long. Their hesitation cost them another dozen warriors, but then they were away, a savage bark springing from the remaining fifty mouths. Into the twilight of the trees they drove, before another bowstring could sing to grapple with their mysterious assailants. Hanik had time enough, born of long experience, to place his bow neatly out of harm's way, draw the steel blade from its sheath, and gripped the buckler in his left hand. Next to him, Rune had already discarded the dark green cloak that had helped render them nearly invisible till the trap had been sprung. He felt the weight and balance of the metal weapon, some of the excitement of close quarters action taking hold of him. Sensing his eagerness, Anik spent a moment to glance in his direction. Then they were engulfed in the tearing, crushing mayhem of battle. It was a well-practiced and executed maneuver, one that Hanik's men had performed many times. More green-clad men emerged from their hiding places to encircle the barbarians and cut off any retreat. The speed and violence of the attack overran the quarry within a few moments. The Southlanders were not armored and fell quickly to the blows of their ambushers. The leather armor of the latter aided in lessening wounds and fatalities. As soon as the last blow had been struck, Hanik signaled to a dark-skinned member of their band. See what you can find, Ressa. The latter marched into the clearing with long strides, and soon they heard him calling out in what Rune assumed to be the language of the locals. He and the rest of the men did a quick sweep of the village in search of any survivors or lurking enemies. It was a small village, perhaps thirty huts and it was thus easy to see why they would not have been able to put up much of a fight against the invaders. Nothing moved among the huts. Even dogs that had not escaped quickly enough had been speared or clubbed to death. There was a press of fallen bodies near the central clearing facing east, where the men had tried to make some stand. Most of the thatched roofs were engulfed in flames, sending columns of smoke straight up into the breathless air. The men's boots crunched on smashed pottery as they walked. They were hailed from the north as they grouped themselves back in the clearing. Two figures approached through the smoke. One Rune recognized as the interpreter, the other was unfamiliar. It was a smallish woman, youthful and slim, and though her eyes darting from one foreign figure to another showed her wariness, the jutting of her chin and the poise of her body testified that she was unafraid. She spoke rapidly and with some excitement, so that the interpreter had to hold up his hand before he could translate what had already been said. She is the daughter of the local chieftain. Her father and brother fell in the first assault. She says that there were many more Amo to the east, and they will certainly come back with larger numbers. It was Hanik's turn to raise his hand. Ask her if there are any of their men who survived. The woman was scornful at the question, and gestured disgustedly towards the west as she replied. She says there are a few, but they are well hidden in the jungle, or many miles away. Tell her to get the women and children to gather what they can from the burning huts uh, and assemble here. Also, we need some of the bigger boys to make a quick search for any remaining wounded or hidden men. We march within the hour. Rune seemed lost in thought, a slight frown creasing the skin between his eyes. He gripped the side of the boat as it sped towards the waiting ships. He was glad to be out of the oppressive jungle thickets, 
and on the open water again. The sea and its wide horizon had become an integral part of him during his cycles as a wayfarer. The endless roll of the waves, the play of the light on the shifting surface, the mirrored blue dome of the sky, many facets of a single jewel, all combined to affect the very soul of a man. He turned to address the figure next to him. Anik sat with an equal frown, absently flicking sand and the remainders of jungle mud from his boots with the tip of his bow. It did not go too well today. The man raised his eyebrows, but the frown did not disappear. No, it did not. Somehow the Amul warriors got it into their heads to attack a full hour before they were supposed to. You knew the exact hour of their attack. We did, though it seems of little use if they are not to be punctual. How is it that you had such particular knowledge of the plans of these savages? Several cycles ago, we had no means of acquiring it. Then we had to rely on local rumors and what we could discern of their patterns of conquest. But recently, two of our recruits managed to infiltrate the Empire's inner circles. The information they gather has proved invaluable. Rune pondered this for a while before remarking, I was aware of some disturbances along the coast, of course, but never realized the extent of the Gudrid Empire's aggression. They are attempting to subject all the Rethu tribes. That is so. The Federation of the Giri is subjected and paying tribute. Serious inroads have been made as far west as Dar Olam. Even the men of the teeth, the Tuatneth, are cowering in their thickets. The fiercely independent Rethu peoples are the last still resisting. Yes, he grimaced. Malik's left arm is almost ready to lash out. Rune stared at him. Malik? He is behind us. How? He has set himself up as their god. Not in his present guise, of course. He is Hawk Irix, the meaning of which is difficult to translate, but reveals something of his true nature, I believe. It means a frenzied consumer of spirit and flesh, a title reserved for their king of demons. It is a well-orchestrated trickery. The rituals are demonstrative and accompanied by unspeakable cruelty and horror, just the type of thing that would bring the savage to his knees in worship. The flesh is consumed literally, which is nothing new for the Amul, and the spirit is consumed by the sheer suffering inflicted on the sacrifices, both physically and mentally. You can imagine why such a cult would be popular among the southerners. It puts forth raw power and brutality, the forces they respect most. He knows how to impress them, and he has been doing it for several hundred cycles. Rune was at once reminded of the curious conversation he had had with the Ligerian princess on the day of his departure from that realm. He is one of the old ones, then. If he is not, he is the chief priest of the darkest and vilest of them. Rune was shaking his head. This is too fantastic for belief. Hanek looked at him in an odd way. Some of these things one needs to see for oneself. <laughs> large relieving force from Ligerium, by forced marching through the nights, reached the scene of the slaughter in the Tristwood, only two days after the assault on the makeshift fort had claimed the lives of Vengis and the vast majority of its defenders. The sight of the mutilated corpses of their countrymen, the feasting ravens and reek of the battlefield, weakened the knees of the untried, as it fueled the thirst for vengeance in the veterans. The survivors inside the inner palisade welcomed him warmly enough, but these were haggard and shockingly few in number compared to the bright host that had departed for Lysan only a few days previously. Even the Nurians made an uncharacteristic show of their rejoicing at the reprieve. They had run out of arrows entirely and had been expecting the final assault of the enemy that night. As it was, the forces of Lysan and his allies had in all probability suffered such casualties that they had taken to their heels as soon as the relief had been spotted. Yet, with the evidence of the massacre still so freshly displayed, the Ligerian host slumped down in fearful despondency. 
not even the presence of Teoric himself, with a thousand more soldiers on the morrow, moved the men to more than a sullen obedience when they had to pile and burn the bodies. The arrival of Nurian reinforcements boosted the failing morale of the Allied forces in Lysan. Captain Melvor and his 600 men from Nuria immediately inspired confidence, despite their relatively small number. The black and scarlet uniforms of the Guard were known and respected, as was the ability of these men to turn the tide of battle and the many successes of the seasoned soldier who led them. The invading host now numbered over 6,000 men, with the finest of Nuria among them. This more than compensated for the inexperience and low morale of some of the Ligerian soldiers. When the Nurians arrived, the stench of burnt bodies still hung over the camp. Malvor strode through the Ligerian tents towards the tall pavilions of Turek and Prince Lucain, and quickly gauged the mood of the men. They moved among the splintered timbers and blackened grass with slow, heavy strides, as if the ordinary tasks of cleaning and cooking were part of an unbearable sentence they had been forced to carry out. The defeat of Morland's host had somehow translocated from the dead men to the living, as if it had been they who had participated in the hopeless battle. Hardly any of the Ligerians would look him in the eye as he passed. Lucain was openly elated to see him. His long hair and guard uniform were not as finely groomed as was his custom, and his dark-rimmed eyes testified of his recent ordeal. He steered the captain towards Teoric's tent, chatting all the while. A good thing you arrived so promptly, Melbor. Father did not waste any time in deliberations, I see. No, Prince, he did not. In fact, he seemed to have expected bad news from the south. The Prince peered at him curiously. Did he now? Malvor continued. How fared our men? Many casualties? Lucain sounded evasive. One dead, three wounded, and that one disobeyed a direct command, or he would still be with us. The captain's eyebrows rose. But one? How could this be when the Ligerian host was all but massacred? The younger man placed a hand on his arm and lowered his voice conspiratorially. These Ligerians have grown soft, Melbourne, with their luxuries and rich food. I would prefer our hillmen to these bastard-born. Melvor was taken aback. He had not realized that the prince subscribed to one of the baser of the old tenets, putting forth that the race of Ligerium had sprung from an illicit union between a Nurian high king and a barbarian female in the ancient times. This reduced the Ligerians to embarrassing cousins, who stained Nurian memory and reputation by their mere existence. Though he granted each man the right to formulate his own beliefs within the tenets, he also resented the tone his former pupil employed in addressing him. There was a definite undertone of condescension, of superiority. He had picked up hints at this changing attitude before, but had chosen to ascribe it to Lucane's natural tendency towards pride and arrogance. The prince outranked him in the kingdom, but what was reflected now was not the superiority of standing, but rather that of knowledge and purpose, as if the captain of the royal guard had become a mere thrall in the king's designs, and had no inkling of what the true intentions of any of the king's actions and commands were. He was to be cajoled and manipulated like a child, never knowing enough to form a proper opinion, always on the outskirts of understanding. It was a rude awakening. He merely nodded in response, keeping his thoughts concealed behind the mask of his expressionless face. Nevertheless, he suspected that the prince had sensed something of his mood, for he did not pursue this line of thought. Instead, he expressed his concern over the morale of the Ligerians, and stressed the need for drastic action, or the outcome of the entire campaign would be in jeopardy, despite their large numbers. Malvor's mind had already commenced wandering along these corridors as he had strolled through the camp, and he was about to reply when the tent flaps in front of them parted and Turek stepped through. 
Ah, we are heartened by the sight of you, Captain Melvor. His smile seemed to bear out his claim. I had not expected your arrival till several days from now. He grasped the other man's arm with both his hands, his smile widening. Captain Melvor could not help noticing the luxurious interior of the pavilion, for a campaign tent it surpassed in size any he had seen. The furnishings seemed more reminiscent of a well-kept salon in the king's sun-tied palace in Varus than the functional and simplified trappings of a general on campaign. From the elaborately carved trestles and folding chairs to Tyrick's over-large bed, only partially visible behind its embroidered screen, the place proclaimed the opulence of its inhabitants and their taste for comfort. Even the servants refrained from sleeping on the ground and had their own raised stretchers. Everywhere he looked, the light played on rich purples and silk, on tasseled cloth of gold and the sable on green boar of the duke. He caught himself wondering if the prince had indeed been just in his harsh assessment of the Ligerians. Zurich motioned them to chairs surrounding his tabled campaign map before he seated himself. He folded his arms. No need for me to comment on the unfortunate outcome of our first thrust, though I may mention that the resistance has been of a far greater ferocity and on a larger scale than we could have anticipated. The scouts reported marsh as well as desert peoples among their assailants. Borgrest must have been in league with these raiders for some time to call on such allies. It also appears that Malik Ilian's rule is slipping in the south, if men from his realm have joined with Lysan. Malvor saw Lucane hide a quick smile out of the corner of his eye before the prince commented. I mean no disrespect, Eric, but this operation should never have been placed in the hands of a bungler like Duke Morlan. The captain's interest was aroused. Morlan? Did he? Was he among the casualties? No, Tyrick replied. I sent him back to Aruis on extended leave, which no doubt will end in an overdue retirement. Why, if I may be so bold as to ask, was he placed in command? I had little to do with his commission. I'm afraid King Tregoran insisted that his old friend lead the campaign. It was meant to be some sort of retirement gift in return for his loyalty. Thuric shrugged. I volunteered to lead it myself, and even suggested Tregoran's own son, Venkis, but to no avail. Melvor raised his eyebrows. He had not been aware of any old tie of friendship between Tregoran and Morlan, but then he had little insight into Ligerian politics. What struck a definite false note was the Duke's claim of suggesting Vengis as commander. He was well aware of the reputation of this capable but unstable captain, and knew that the idea of his leading a campaign was preposterous. For a moment he perceived the same hint of dishonesty and hidden purpose he had detected earlier in the prince's attitude. Did these men think him a fool, that they believed he would not see through their inept efforts at clouding their intentions? What game were they playing? He glanced at Lucane, but the prince's face now wore a mask of indifference, betraying nothing of his true thoughts. The duke spoke again, a little too hastily, as if he had perceived something of Melvor's sudden doubt. Be that as it may, we have to make the best of what we have inherited from Morlan. I need also not tell you that the morale of the Ligerians has taken a severe blow at the sight of their fallen countrymen. Good men died here in defeat, and their burning has affected every one of their comrades. Lucane looked at him keenly, as if measuring the sincerity of his words. Then he addressed Melvor. How many Nurians did my father send down with you? Five hundreds from Ingerval and Stor, as well as the remaining hundred of the Royal Guard. And their morale? Melvor straightened his shoulders a bit as he replied. Unimpaired. Lucane turned to Turek. We have an impressive Nurian host now, Duke. It seems that if there be any doubt, it concerns the fighting ability of your soldiers. Thuric showed signs of discomfort for the first time. They will recover their spurts soon enough. They seem ready to break, in my opinion. You know little of Ligerian soldiers, Prince. 
I believe you underestimate them. Turek turned to Melvor as if seeking his support. What is your assessment of our situation, Captain? Melvor hesitated. He suddenly saw the weakness in this Duke of Ligerium. Turek was a schemer, a man of politics, and a clever twist of words, but would never be the commander that men respected and for whom they would give their lives. He knew King Tregoran was even less of a man of action than his nephew, the Duke. Had the blood of Ligerium grown so thin? Would he have to subject Lysan with his Nurians alone? A little tremor of trepidation touched his own resolve. Some drastic action was needed. His reply was intended to shock. Your men seem just as dead as the ones you burned. I would say that was rather blunt. Thuric fought with a sudden surge of anger. They have not had a pleasant task to perform, and are for the most part not seasoned men. They will not storm a city while under this cloud of doom. We cannot undo what has been done, Captain. Nor can we allow it to turn us all into mourning old wives. If you have something to contribute, apart from stating the obvious unpleasant truth, I would appreciate it. Melvor measured out his words carefully, as if instructing a novice in a dangerous task he was about to perform for the first time. Get the sergeants to form up the men for a night march. We relocate the camp, at least two leagues closer to Breck before we settle. And this will be no march of stealth either. We will stay in our ranks and launch out with trumpet sounding. When the trumpeters tire, we will sing. Turek could not conceal his astonishment. Sing? As if our lives depended on it. Surely you are jesting. This is not some tenth day out in for cadets, Captain. He turned in incredulity towards the silent Lucane. Malvor continued. You must be aware that we are under the scrutiny of the enemy, Duke Turek. They will know of the state of demoralization among your men. This will embolden them to the point where their resistance can only be overcome with the utmost difficulty. Imran knows things will be thorny as it is after this debacle. He spat out the last word. This is not a war of annihilation. We need the soldiers of this land to protect their own southern border, and in so doing that of Ligerium and Nuria. We need to show them that we are stronger and more determined than their present king and whoever is aiding him. Then Breck will fall easily and without too much bloodshed. The more blood we spill here, the greater the enmity of those we conquer and intend to rule. No. These men are soon to be our allies. He paused for effect. They must see that the slaughter of our countrymen only strengthened our resolve. We will come openly, while it is they who slink in shadows. We come boldly and in strength, while they do not dare to face us. Of course, Melbor. There is sense in what you say. This from Lucane. I, for one, would be more than happy to leave this ill-fated spot behind as soon as possible. Turek looked from one to the other. Borgres will certainly not expect such a show. He leaned forward to peer at the map. He will hesitate, and while he does... We will move forward, Malvor completed for him. And your men may just take heart. Your men do not need to rest? This is not the time or the place for it. The Nurian captain rose to his feet. We will halt here. He pressed his finger on the map. We will spend what is left of the night in preparation, and on the morrow we march to Breck itself. Turek did not like being treated as a subordinate simply following the orders of his general, but he had to admit to himself that he had no counter-proposal to make. The plan was bold, but seemed sound. He made an effort to save face. What about ambush? It seemed to be their favorite tactic till now. The Ligerians will move in a long column, ten abreast flanked by Nurians and bowmen on both sides. We shall keep the bowmen within sight of the main column. If they are attacked, they will act as skirmishers, supported by the Nurians, and fall back on the main column, which will wheel into line of battle if the attack is severe enough. No rangers or scouts will venture into the forest on either side by themselves. All reconnaissance will be done in force and with speed. Melvor was the picture of self-assurance and competence. The flanking forces will be under the command of myself and the prince, respectively, and I suggest that you array yourself at the head of the main column. Select your best captains to control the bowmen. He turned to leave, 
not waiting for comments or suggestions from the others. Both men rose to their feet. Lucane's brow carried a slight frown. He seemed to dislike Malvor's confident manner and commanding tone even more than did Tiorik. Malvor gave him no opportunity to think of some clever remark. We have little time, sirs, he said, and strode through the tent door, smiling to himself. Let them have their secrets. It took more than scheming and politics to run a campaign. of Breck was built around a natural junction of the western road skirting the Tristwood from Finvale, and the highway leading southwards from Ligerium towards the wetlands of Terallon. The present town had derived its name from an ancient ruin situated some ten miles to the south, equidistant from the other principal towns of the kingdom of Lysan, Teppen, and Hurst. The old town had been overrun so many times for no one had bothered rebuilding the stone walls or houses, and the inhabitants had constructed their hovels of timber and mud. It had degenerated into an unseemly and unhealthy environment, where no traveler or merchant desired to visit. When a bout of marsh fever had reduced the population to fewer than half its original number, the remainder had fled for their lives, burning the place behind them. They had halted their flight at the junction of the roads. A new town had risen, once more fashioned of stone from the eastern mountains, and flourished as an open market hub where peoples from the desert of Fez to the snow-capped mountains of Nuria could meet and exchange their wares. Malvor shielded his eyes against the afternoon sun. He, like the other commanders, had not anticipated much of a resistance from the people of Greg and now it appeared they had been justified. Hardly had the watchers on the town walls spotted the northern hills crested with an enemy host, when an emissary came marching through the main gate under a banner of truce. The captain's keen sight had already taken the measure of the defenses confronting the invaders. Breck was a difficult site to protect. It lacked a uniform defensive wall that would delay a besieger for any significant length of time, since the construction was partially of wood and nowhere more than ten feet in height. It was little more than a palisade. The gatehouse seemed the only sound structure of the entire curtain wall, flanked as it was by two square stone towers that for their sturdiness seemed to belong to another era. People had not been prevented from building their hovels right up to the base of the wall in places. Here and there one could reach the top of the wall from a moldy roof. It was clear that this town had not seen a siege of any significance for a long time. The negotiator was understandably nervous, in the light of the heavy defeat his countrymen and their mysterious allies had inflicted on the Ligerians he now had to present with terms. His eyes failed to meet those of the formidable men before him, even after he had straightened up from his bow. He claimed to represent the people of Breck, and not their former king, Borgrest, who had taken to his heels at the approach of the enemy host, and whom they had subsequently deposed. He emphasized that, for the most part, the people of Breck had had no desire to oppose the will of Ligerium and Nuria. Most of their former king's soldiers had been forced to take up arms, and had deserted at the first opportunity. Borgrest had been under the influence of wicked men from the south, on whom he had heaped favors at the cost of the local merchants and landowners. In fact, Breck was ready to welcome the invaders as their liberators. At these last words he glanced at them quickly to gauge their reaction. Then he looked down again his face flushed and expectant. 
Malvor kept himself out of the ensuing bargaining. He would leave the verbal battles to politicians, such as Turek. Instead, he let his eyes wander over the grassy hills surrounding Grek, while he pictured for himself the difficulties they would have to overcome in the uneasy peace following a conquest, even one as relatively bloodless as this. The renegade king would have to be hunted down, his family incarcerated, his friends stripped of power. Then the people of Lysan would have to be mobilized into countering the threat of the raiders from the Fes and defending themselves, if need be, against their former king's allies. It seemed probable that he would spend the remaining five seasons of the cycle and a good part of the next one here in the south. Theoric had by this time thoroughly intimidated the poor emissary with his demands of restitution and the amount of loot that would spare the inhabitants of Grek. Malvor could not help wondering what proportion of these proceeds would find its way into the Duke's personal coffers, but his expression remained impassive. It was true that the Ligerians had paid for the conquest almost exclusively with their own. Theirs was the greatest need for retribution. The faces lining the streets of Grek as they entered were mostly dirty, the bodies draped in the unwashed and often ragged clothes of the town's poor. Malvor could discern faces half hidden in doorways or peering out from behind curtains and suspected that these belonged to the somewhat more affluent citizens who had most to fear from the occupying force. Men would hide their daughters and even their wives in cellars and back rooms at least though they were sure of their safety and things had settled into some pattern of normality. The town had several market squares, some of which they passed through on their way to the keep. Here and there, a lucrative business was still being conducted, despite the excitement and fearful anticipation by the odd opportunists who possessed enough nerve. Most of the stalls were abandoned, however. Even the brave merchants, still crying their wares in the face of conquest, fell silent as the marching soldiers entered their market. They stared, like the ragtag children and beggars of all descriptions, at the polished steel and plumes of the Ligerians, then the uniform finery of the Royal Nurian Guard, and the leather-clad hillmen of the north, and some of the awe and fear that had prevented their competitors from venturing out this day touched them too. Among the colorful and gaudily clothed merchants, a particular man briefly drew Malvor's attention. He was olive-skinned, slight of build, and sported the feather of a peacock in his turban-like hat. But what made him stand out from the crowd was that he was the sole person there to wear a huge smile on his crafty face. As it became apparent to the population of Lysan that the looting of their city would be a controlled and regulated affair, more and more of them ventured out of doors to crowd the streets and watch the invading host marching past. Malvor noticed the racial diversity of this place and marveled that Brick had any sense of itself as a city or any solidarity of motive and action. Fair skins and eyes marked out the descendants of Ligerian migrants of former times, while the darker faces with aquiline noses and high cheekbones of the people standing shoulder to shoulder with them testified of the fez. Here and there the sickly pale complexion of a former marsh dweller dotted the crowd. The number of able-bodied men still among them bore out their claim to a half-hearted support of Borgrest's war. The marching column broke free of the narrow streets into a sizable plaza containing Breck's sole redeeming feature in the eyes of a militarist like the captain. A strong stone keep with a lookout tower stood at the heart of the town and were certainly defensible even if the outer wall was not. Several uniformed guards were still at their posts, though their vigilance was no longer of any consequence, and in the doorway waited what seemed to be the councillors and ministers of the former king. 
they were stricken with the same nervousness as their envoy had displayed, though tidings of how he had been received would have reached them by now. Yet, they probably realized that the Ligerians would exact a high price as compensation for their losses, and for sparing the town and its people. Malvor, once more, kept himself away from the negotiations that followed. He saw to the quartering of his troops in the town's sizable barracks, and retired to his new lodgings inside the keep. A groveling chamberlain was only too happy to accede to his every request, and having instilled the venerable captain in one of the former king's many wives' luxurious rooms, scurried off to arrange for some refreshment to be brought. A servant had been dispatched at the same time to ready a bath for him in a private antechamber. Once refreshed and fortified by the excellent meal, he made his way to the roof. The two Nurian soldiers who guarded him against assassination kept their distance once their captain had found a good spot overlooking the town. They knew he disliked being interrupted while formulating his strategies. Captain Melbourne appreciated the superb view from the roof. He had considered climbing the additional thirty-foot ladder into the lookout tower, but what he could see now was more than sufficient to aid him in gaining the perspective he needed. From here one might visualize the fortifications and preparations required to withstand a possible siege of any intensity or duration. One might weigh the strong and weak points of the present defense and shape the sprawling town into an impregnable fortress. Some hour or two had to have slipped by, for the relief, Ligerian this time, of the guards in the watchtower arrived at the sounding of the bell for the first night watch. The captain's own soldiers approached at the same time, with a familiar-looking figure between them. This man has requested to have a private word with you, Captain. The guard motioned towards the man in the peacock feathered hat, who Melvor recognized now as the same merchant he had spotted in the crowd earlier that day. Search him thoroughly, then retire. He was not about to trust to the goodwill of a doubtful-looking stranger. The guards complied roughly, while the same broad smile split the man's features. His teeth were not broken, or in bad condition as Melvor had supposed earlier. They were merely badly stained through the chewing of Fren, a mild stimulant cultivated in the drier, hotter areas round the inland sea, and sometimes believed to have medicinal value. His eyes were quick and crafty, and he kept him fixed on the captain all the while. He squared his shoulders and straightened his clothes as the guards retreated empty-handed. Then he bowed himself almost to the ground, waiting to receive permission to speak. Malvor was slightly amused by this unfamiliar show of respect, and not entirely displeased. Rise, merchant, and speak what is on your mind. The man's voice carried something of the silks he, no doubt, kept as part of his stock. My lord captain, thank you for allowing your unworthy servant into your presence. It gives me pleasure to place my humble self at your disposal. Melvor raised his eyebrows. And why would I require the services of a merchant? There was the smile again. A merchant, yes, Maresh but one with an ear close to the ground, one who, with many others, desires to protect his interests, uh, one who does not wish to be pressed down under the iron heel of the former king. He paused to spit behind him. Ever again. And how would a spying merchant be of service to me? It is the will of Imran, Marish, that your humble servant be your eyes and ears in this strange town. Many things take place here that one cannot see on the surface. The man's servile attitude was beginning to irritate Melvor. Why would you not approach the prince or the duke? I am only a military man, not a governor. The prince is young and inexperienced. The duke sees only what he desires. He shrugged his shoulders. Both of them will soon return to their homes. And who will keep the town against the invasion? You have knowledge of a planned invasion? The captain's interest was aroused instantly. Borgrest's allies? 
There was no trace of a smile now. In its place was a furrowed brow and wide eyes revealing traces of fear. His allies, yes. And they have far more power than they have shown thus far. He dropped his voice to a conspiratorial whisper, taking a step closer. One may wish to fortify this town with all haste and make sure of one's allies. There is talk of war from Finvale throughout the East to the Barbarian Empire. There are even whispers of the unleashing of the swarm. Ha! Ah! Melvor drew back in disgust. Did the man think him a fool? You have evidence of this? Who needs more evidence, Maresh, than the strange times that are upon us? He raised a well-groomed hand and marked off the points by bending a finger for each one as he spoke. King Borgrest turns against his powerful neighbor and long-standing ally. The Vadron of Fenvale are making preparations to flood their lowlands. The slave trade from the east has all but dried up. Warriors from the lower marshlands of Taralan are quartered in Hurst to aid Borgrest, while Taralan itself remains allied with Ligerium. He held up another hand. Weapons have become unaffordable. Since the smithies in Lysan, the Fez, and Taralan cannot supply them fast enough to the war-mad Gudrid Empire. This empire is swallowing the last of the small tribes along the coast and looking hungrily towards the north. He dropped his hands. And these things are on the surface, easy to see, and the topics of conversation in many circles within this town. Then one would do well to pay heed to the rumors of secret motives and dark plans, wouldn't one? Malvor struggled within himself. He was not sure what to make of this enigmatic character. Whose interest was at stake here? Was he not perhaps an agent of some higher power himself, with instructions to influence the commander of any occupying force to act in some way that would compromise its safety? Even so, it would not hurt to gain his confidence, to explore the intrigues of the southern realms in this uncertain time, though as a military man Melvor had little stomach for it. I will meet with you, regularly, and in private. Make arrangements with Fabin regarding the time and place. He nodded towards one of the guards, standing warily at some distance from them. I harbor no illusions that the next cycle or two will be untroubled for Lysan, and thus it would be expedient for the forces of rationality and order to ally themselves for mutual benefit and security. I congratulate you on your insight and understanding, Maresh. I may add that I expected no less from you. After all, you have quite a reputation. It is perhaps not by chance that you are here in Breck at this critical time. His bow was as low and exaggerated as before. Arid's excited laughter echoed round the large courtyard. Maris, the servant Vengis had entrusted to Heldred, had the boy on his shoulders, and was cantering rather recklessly around the perimeter. Heldred smiled to herself. Perhaps her son was not as oversensitive as she had believed him to be, after all. It was surprising, and not at all displeasing to her, that he had taken such a liking to this rather bashful young man from Vengis' house. It was also disconcerting that he could trust someone about whom he knew so little so quickly and absolutely. How easy it would be to take advantage of such trust! She frowned. Surely these suspicions and doubts had no place in her home in Amrus. No doubt Vengis' letter and Teoric's visit were to blame. Or perchance she was still too aware of her recent re-encounter with the wiles of the unscrupulous men at court. 
A brilliant sun-tied morning sun lay in patches on the paving, as it fell through arches and windows, alternating with pools of shade. Haldred had installed herself in one of these from where she could watch the antics of the two as they dashed through one bright rectangle after another. She was forced to applaud when they eventually tired of their exuberance and traipsed up to where she was seated. Both of them were flushed and red in the face, Maris from the running and her son from excitement. Aerid jumped off as the man bent down and rushed up to her, his voice shrill with pleasure. Maris says in the Easterlands there are horses strong enough to ride, and they go much faster than this. He stabbed downwards with one finger, pointing at the courtyard paving. Like the wind. He beckoned the servant closer. Tell her. Haldred smiled and looked at her overexcited child. His dark hair and his blue-gray eyes resembled her own, and that of her mother, Rewin. His litheness of limb, apparent even at this young age, he had inherited from Julos, whose athletic form was only used for showing off the latest fashion at court. She did not regret keeping him away from Aruis for as long as possible, even if ambition would demand his presence there later in life. Here he was happy and carefree, oblivious of the petty jealousies to which his inheritance would expose him. Maris seemed thoroughly embarrassed at Arid's prompting, and looked down at his sandaled feet. Haldred came to his rescue. You have travelled to the east then, Maris? He glanced up at her, seemingly even more embarrassed than before. No, princess, that is, my lord Vengus related to me uh, some of the tales from the far-off places. He looked at her questioningly, as if he expected to be called a liar. Not that he had gone east himself, but he spoke to so many strange people and travellers. Uh, he must have heard. He broke off abruptly. Haldred realized suddenly that the young man had grown accustomed to being disbelieved or even mocked, since his former master had borne a bad reputation for all his tall stories and prophecies of doom. Yet Maris was fiercely loyal, and he would not risk his master's memory to suffer even now, especially at the hand of his own sister. And here she was, still in doubt whether she could believe a word her eccentric brother had spoken to her. She forced a little smile. A servant hurried into the courtyard, apparently with urgent tidings, and broke the uncomfortable silence. Aldred rose to her feet as he approached. She recognized the old man as one of the servants who had accompanied her from Aruis so many cycles ago. The man's eyes were wide, and he addressed her without waiting for permission. My lady, Lord Julos has just arrived from Aruis unannounced. He is in a foul mood. He struck down Tenos for not getting out of his way quickly enough. Tenos was only cleaning the stairs as he does every day. He has threatened the cook with a whipping because there is no meal prepared. And when the man defended himself by saying that you had given instructions to be more frugal and only prepare meals at regular hours, he called you a foul name right in front of the servants. And he has... Haldred held up a hand to stem the flow of words. A dark cloud had suddenly descended upon her. Something terrible had to have happened to drive Julos away from his pleasures at court. Her mind leaked from one scandal to another, a discovered flirtation and an angry husband of high rank, vowing to take vengeance for the insult to his honor, an unforgivable affront to the priests in an unguarded drunken moment. Refusal, deliberate or not, of heeding the summons of the king or high counselor, perchance a combination of several. The face of her son displayed the same curious mix of emotions she experienced within herself. Arid stared at the old servant in consternation. He was clearly excited at the return of his little seen father, yet the violent entry characteristic of Julos' explosive temper filled him with trepidation. The fear and disgust apparent in the attitude of the servant, no doubt shared by the rest of the household, turned what should have been a joyous occasion into something of an embarrassment. The boy turned questioning eyes on her. Aldred addressed the servant instead. Where is he now? He has gone into the bath hall, I believe. Something made the old man stop and look behind him, 
Next to her, Arid gave a violent start as her husband, flushed with anger, strode through the doorway. Well, here she is, the poor hostess from royal blood, unable to run the household of a lowly lord. Welcome home, Julos. Haldred merely smiled at the sneering allusion to her parentage. She had grown used to Julos' inability to cope with the fact that he was merely a younger son of a duke, one who would not even inherit the title from his father, but end up as some equivalent of a rich country squire. Yet he conveniently ignored the equally irrelevant fact that she was but the youngest daughter of a king and queen whose reign would not even last till their deaths, nor necessarily extend itself through their direct natural issue. You must have missed your rustic estate terribly to forsake the enticements of the court in such haste that you are unable to send word of your arrival, or is it merely your customary lack of consideration? She could not keep the bite out of her voice. Consideration! He spat out the word. Should the son of a duke now fashion his living for the convenience of some gaggle of pestilent lackeys? No, my lord. He should merely include his wife, who runs his household, in this living, so that she may adequately prepare for his comfort when he arrives. No doubt you are referring to the cold hearth and the empty kitchen. What has come over you? Is it not to the benefit of the entire household if the head of it keeps a frugal table? I do not believe one should squander frugality. He was shouting now. I am a man of wealth and position, not some pathetic tradesman eking out an existence with his lowly skills. Should I squat in some miserly corner, wringing my hands over a few copper coins when my barns are overflowing? I know that you are used to the excesses of my father's table at court, and that you would now expect some comparable arrangement in your home. I am not of a miserly disposition. I merely count it a shame that a mountain's affair fit for the palate of a king should grow stale awaiting his chance appetite, and invariably, for the most part, end up as the dinner of the hogs. She spoke slowly and deliberately, as if lecturing a stubborn and troublesome child. Had we been informed of your imminent arrival, we would certainly have been adequately prepared for it. Julos stood gnashing his teeth. Far from appeasing him, this little lecture had merely fouled his temper even further. He glanced away from her, searching for a new line of attack. The servants withered under his gaze. His son peered out from behind Haldred, Julos' eyes fixed upon him. And... Is it part of the duties of the head of my household to make a recluse and little country miser out of my son and heir as well? He folded his arms. If you cannot cope with the pace of life at court, should he be deprived of a natural education? Do not presume to lecture me on his education. Haldred knew that her husband had picked on this old argument to regain some moral leverage in their exchange. When it concerned Arid, she was unreasonable and emotional. She could not defend her conduct and unwillingness to take him to court from any rational standpoint. Yet here was one issue on which she could not compromise or play at words. Her protective love for her son made her vulnerable in a way that even her lost dream of Julos did not. I know that as his father you have the right to assign his tutors and plan the course of his upbringing, but your time at court has clearly clouded your judgment in this matter. What are you insinuating? You presume too much, woman, to pass. Stop this pretense! Haldred suddenly could not care that there were two servants trapped in this tempestuous courtyard with them, that her son stood trembling beside her, and should never hear what she was about to say. All the bitter disappointment and humiliation, all the ache of a vanished ideal, all her frustrated hopes spilled from her in angry words. You and I and the rest of Myro all know what happens at court. Your son will never sit on a throne. No, he will be trodden underfoot like the grapes in a wine press to further the ambition of some other man's son. He will be pulled from the side and that to be discarded when he no longer has a use. There were tears in her voice now and desperation. Do you think they respect you for what you've done or what you do? You are an amusement to them no more. All your drunken wit and foolish jesting. They laugh at you and at me for marrying you. Do you want your son to be reduced to such as that? There was a stunned silence. Then Julos stepped up to her and raised his hand as if to strike her. 
She stood unmoving, challenging, yet inwardly cringing that he would follow through. For a moment it seemed as if he would. She could feel Arid's arms tightly round her waist. She was prepared for the blow, and what would inevitably follow, for she would not hold her peace to save him from the consequences of such an action. Then the clenched fist became a stabbing finger, which he thrust under her nose. You are mistaken if you think that. There's no man that blames me or mocks me for turning away from such as you, nor false self-righteousness, when you were the sweetest little rose in the garden of the king, lovers buzzing around you like bees in green swell. And all of them knew that your birth, which you esteemed so highly, would not advance them in the slightest. He paused to catch his breath. What do you think they intended for you? That I married you, if I'd only known. For here you are, locked away in the country, pursuing your infidelity without restraint, making sport behind my back with lowly peasants. Haldred gasped in shock. She could find no reply and nearly stared at him. You do not deny it. How could you, when I walk in and see you amusing yourself in front of our son with this? He motioned towards Maris. Youth! All the while the household is in disarray. Then you dish up some story about frugality. Haldred found it difficult to breathe. Had she heard him correctly? This is not... This is Maris, who served Vingus, my brother. Yes, yes, and now he serves you, is that it? And how many has there been before him? He leaned in close enough so that she could smell the stale wine on his breath. He pointed his finger at Arid. Should I wonder if this boy is indeed my son? Without waiting for a reply, he angrily turned on his heel and stalked out. The blood that had left Haldred's face at the first vile accusation now returned with a painful rush. She could not trust her voice, even if she could think of a reply. Her son clung to her, his body trembling with sobs. The two stunned servants looked at each other, embarrassed into inactivity. Haldred finally managed the whisper. Leave me. She drew her son into her arms and gave herself over to the well of indignation inside. Disturbed though she was at his sudden arrival and the subsequent disruption of her quiet life, she had to confess to herself a shameful enjoyment of his fall into disfavor, or whatever lot had befallen Julos to rob him of his reveling. This satisfaction almost made up for the fact that she would have to bear the brunt of his ire. She was curious as to what indiscretion had finally denied him the favors of those painted bags of corruption at court. This day had marked what seemed to her the final breach between them. His allegations against her fidelity, whether he meant them in truth or not, whether they were grounded in real suspicion or not, whether she had entertained thoughts in this direction or not, had reduced her to the level of the courtly trollops she so despised. He was a loathsome thing to her now, a monster from whom she had to protect her son at all costs, and he would find that she could not be put under so easily by mere words. Yet part of her pitied him still. His pathetic attempts to justify his own whoring exposed his guilt all the more. His pleasure-crazed existence testified of the fact that he was unfulfilled and immature. He had not found in her whatever his needs had been. What they were now, she supposed, he no longer knew. Imran's orb was driving hard for the western horizon by the time she had reached the rooms into which he had withdrawn after their altercation in the courtyard. His immediate needs would have been seen to. He would be refreshed and in a more agreeable mood. Perchance they could find some common ground, now that the tension of past cycles had been relieved. He looked at her questioningly, as she entered unannounced, as though to gauge her mood. A servant who stood at the ready to keep Julas' wine cup filled discreetly removed himself without being dismissed. The entire castle had, no doubt, been informed of the clash of words between the lord and lady by this time. This man had no desire to be witness to a renewal of the strife. Julos had already been drinking, and by the look of it would continue till he was no longer able. It was clear that he wanted to forget whatever had driven him from the capital. Again she felt pity for this overlarge child that was her husband. 
His physical condition had deteriorated at some stage, but she could not recall exactly when. His face was flushed, even though he was sober enough, his eyes somewhat bloodshot. He had gained some fat around the hips and middle. Soon he would no longer be the dandy bewitching the courtesans in Erewis. It struck her anew how aloof they had become physically and emotionally. She had little or no insight into what motivated his actions at court, as she had little to no interest in his bodily well-being. He was a stranger to her now, but had he ever been anything more? She tried to remember the excitement of her wedding day, the splendor of the occasion, the handsome young man that had been her groom. How could it be possible for one to have been so blind? And yet, he had won her heart. He had been the answer to her most intimate longings. It was utterly incomprehensible. His voice betrayed his fatigue, yet he made an effort at initiating what he expected to be a renewal of hostilities. Come to revile me some more, have you? Haldred ignored this opening thrust, and kept her own voice as impassive and unemotional as possible. What right do you think you have, husband, to address me in such a manner in front of servants? He looked at her, measuring her resolve. Exactly that. The right of any husband to ensure the pure blood of his issue, to prevent some randy peasant from... How dare you! Haldred felt the blood rising to her cheeks. Common ground be damned. His insinuations were intolerable. This conversation would not proceed in the manner she had intended. I am not one of the high-born trollops you spend your time with at court. My parents... Yes, yes. And I've had just about enough of your oh-so-royal parentage. He widened his eyes and curled his lip. I could tell I could tell you a few things. What is this? You have no respect for your king and legitimate ruler that you may speak so lightly. But I see. It is perhaps this very reason that you have been turned out of your haunts in the capital. Did you insult my father in the same way you are accustomed to insulting me? Were you banished for that reason? Judas stared at her. For a moment she found his mood impossible to read. Then he burst out laughing. <laughs> He threw back his head and laughed uproariously. <laughs> so that is what my scheming wife believes. That her mockery of a husband has been thrown out of Arius for his misconduct. He slowly rose to his feet and folded his arms. No, my dearest. It is the exact opposite of what you would have hoped. I have indeed been honored with a commission. He raised his chin. You are looking at the newly appointed governor of Lysan, latest acquisition of the kingdom of Ligerium. He paused to let this information sink in. Haldred found herself speechless yet again. Could he be lying to her? Lysan? A whole kingdom for me to govern. What a responsibility. His tone was mocking and sarcastic. Yet my wife would not trust me with the education of a child. How could it be? Haldred could not make head or tail of it. There were so many more capable and worthy candidates for the governorship of what would surely be a troubled area. Did Turek have something to do with this? It was so ironic that instead of fleeing eastwards as her brother had urged, she would now move right into the path of peril with her little family. She wanted to laugh. This is no jest. Ah, oh, it is true enough, even if it is hard for you to believe. Julos' enjoyment of his wife's stupefaction had worn off. He flopped down in his chair, his face clouded. Yet it is a doubtful honor. That council of crows has some sense of cruelty to banish me to a pile of dirt like Breck. Have you seen it, dear wife? A fine collection of hovels. Lauren knows I will be forced to cart wagon loads of wine with me, only to survive. He seemed thoroughly depressed. Haldred hid her smile at his use of the very word he had found so amusing just before. You will have to take us with you. It was futile to hope otherwise. Of course. Governor Julos and his loving wife and son will leave for his dunghill within the ten day. He stared at her, his eyes wide with the horror of the thought. What in the name of the great lecher am I supposed to do with Lysan? Thank you.